Look at your chatty, lively bunch. Must be a two cup of coffee morning. If you don't know who I am, by the way, I'm Pastor David. I'm normally at New Life North, uh, but it's always a joy as a Manitou resident uh, to worship with you guys. And man, the worship was just so strong this morning. Can we thank our worship team just for their faithfulness? You know, what you experienced this morning, and I, I got to get into my sermon, but I just got to give credit where credit's due, but what you experienced this morning isn't people just playing C, D, and G on a guitar. That, what you experienced, was a result of prayer and faithfulness in the quiet place to come prepared with spirits that are full to be able to pour out worship to a living God. And so um, the good ones make it look easy, so thank you guys. And also our AV tech team. I don't know how much they love they get, but... Yeah. I'm particularly fond of them because I'm such a procrastinator and I wait to the last minute to turn my sermon in. And so last night, like at 1130, I sent it to Dan back there and he's putting in the slides this morning and the crack of dawn. So thank you, bro. And thank you for the team. All right. So we're in this series called Kingdom and Chaos. We're basically, we're just taking the books of first and second Samuel, correct, Joe? Is that right? Just the first Samuel. Okay. The first Samuel. Um, and what we're doing is we're just going chapter by chapter to see what God has to say in these stories that we read in 1 Samuel. The thing is, is not all chapters are created equal. They're equally inspired, but some are easier to preach than others. Like, I mean, you do the David and Goliath, you get the stories like that. I could preach the paint off the walls with David and Goliath, right? A dog with a note could preach that sermon. This week, you just have to take it as it comes. And I get to talk about how uh, this older guy who's really overweight, who's blind, falls backwards in his chair and breaks his neck. I'm going to share a little bit of that with you this morning. Um, also, uh, these, these rats and tumors that are made of gold that are put in a box and uh, sent to the Lord. I get to talk about the rats and the tumors this morning. Are you already inspired and encouraged? Um, and then a couple of cows that have this inner GPS, and they're just sent, and they find their way to God's people. And it's just, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So um, I struggled. And so I listened to this sermon, or I read, I listened to it, the audio Bible, I read through it. And I just couldn't find where to hang my hat um, on these scriptures, because I'm like, how do I bring that to these people and go, this is how you should live? I, I don't know how to do that, but it's so funny. If you're going through like reading through the Bible in a year or you just happen to open the Word of God and just start reading anywhere, sometimes when we get to these spots, we think it's for them. It was for them. It's a historical account that we kind of tuck in our back pockets. But when you ask this question, Lord, what is it you want to say to me? And God, what do you want to say through me, and how would I, should I live moving forward? All of a sudden, these stories about older guys falling back and breaking their necks in chairs, and gold rats and tumors, and these types of things, I have more sermon this morning than I have time to preach. It is amazing how God, the Holy Spirit, says, this is what I'm trying to get across to you. And this morning to you guys here in 2019. And so up to this point, I don't have a lot of time to recap. I would encourage you just to go back and watch the previous sermons. Brett and Pastor Joe just crushed it a couple of weeks ago, um, just opening this whole thing up. But basically, here's what's going on. From the very top, the religious structure, the leadership, the political leaders, all the way through just to the general public of Israel, what has taken place is there has been this erosion, this slow and steady erosion of compromise and sin that has entered into the camps of God's people. And so there's this young boy named Samuel who's being raised in this environment. In particular, he's being raised in the temple. And God chooses this young boy to speak to and to speak through. So Samuel goes and on the behalf of God says, look, God wants me to ultimately tell you this. Enough is enough. We're called to be set apart. We should not live our lives as if there is no living God and pursue idols in this type of thing. No, we, we serve the living God, the one who, when we start singing, like he split the sea wide open and we walked through, we're no longer slaves. This is a song for the Israelites. This is what happened where God re released them from the bondage of slavery and oppression so that they could become people who are free, free to love God and free to love others. We, this is now our song, but the Israelites have allowed compromise to bring in this decay over a period of years, 
And this is where we find Israel. And so this morning, we're spending time between chapters 4 and chapter 7, seeing how God responds to this issue that's taking place in the hearts of his people. And so what I want to do is just, if you just close your eyes, let's just allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do this morning. Um, it's a hard sermon, but it's a right sermon. And so I'm just going to pray Psalm 85 over you guys. And so if you want to even open your hands. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, revive us again. Oh, God, I know that you will because you are a reviving God. Give us a fresh start. Then may the church of Manitou taste your joy and your fullness and your gladness again. God, this morning, may we listen carefully for your voice and wait to hear for whatever you say to us. Let us, Father, in the name of Jesus, hear your promise of peace, the message of every one of your godly lovers longs to hear, God. Father, in the name of Jesus, don't let us in our ignorance turn back from following you, for you have proven, Father, and we know your power and presence shines on all of those who love you. Your glory always hovers over all who bow low before you, God. And so in the name of Jesus, may your mercy and your truth be married together this morning. May the intimacy of your righteousness and peace be witnessed, God. And in the name of Jesus and for your sake, Lord, may your deliverance and peace be your forerunners this morning. Prepare a path for our steps so that we may enter into you. And so, Lord, prepare a path for your steps to us this morning in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, and the things that we are holding sacred, we don't want to submit unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's been some central characters over the last couple of weeks in these books, right? So there's Eli, the high priest, his rotten scoundrel sons, uh, with a Phineas and Hophni, um, with names like that. I mean, were they destined for anything other than what they are? Um, sorry, if your name is Hophni, I'm sorry. Uh, don't mean to offend the Hophnis in the room, but this, and then there's Samuel, but then the main character that we're going to be really talking about in this story is the Ark of the Covenant. It's the central character, and I want to show you a quick picture here of the Ark of the Covenant and take a look at that, and maybe you've seen that before, but if you haven't, if you study the Old Testament, basically the Ark came about when Moses was leading Israel. God gave Moses a command and said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to build this Ark of the Covenant, and then once it's built, you're going to put some things inside of that. One of them being the Ten Commandments. So God is going to give the Ten Commandments. That's going to go in there. That's the law of God. Also, uh, the golden, uh, basically a vase, for lack of a better term, filled with manna to represent God's provision and his love constantly. And then Aaron's rod, which represents priesthood and leadership. And so these things, I wish I had more time to get into it. Like I said, I got more sermon than I've got time to preach. But those things were sacred, ordained by God, put in this ark, this box. It's about two and a half feet tall, about four feet long, uh, two and a half feet wide. And so it could literally fit on this table. So in my mind, for some reason, I don't know why, but I just thought the Ark of the Covenant was like as big as this room. And it's, it wasn't. And there was these poles where the high priests would carry it because they weren't even allowed to touch it. Okay? And so it was the sacred gift from God. But here's the thing that I want to point out that really rocks my world as it relates to those of us who are in Christ and trust in Jesus for what he's done. Those angels there are called the cherubim, and in the middle, God would show up and speak through the middle of that. It's, it's, it's a, if you think about the concept of what this means, it's mind-blowing. It blows my mind. But God, his presence would show up there, and that was known as also the mercy seat where the high priests once a year would basically accumulate all of the sins of the people and sacrifice animals, pour out the blood of sacrificed animals because you can't have the forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood innocent blood, and it would be poured over that part and over the, over the Ark of the Covenant, and this is where the mercy seat of God was. It's very symbolic, and, and if you read Hebrews, it kind of opens up how this was symbolic of what Jesus has ultimately come to do, and so he shed his blood for us once and for all so that we can come in and out of the Holy of Holies, whereas under this order, only the high priest once a year could go into the presence of God and atone for the sins of Israel. If anybody came in with unclean hands or an impure spirit, they would be struck dead immediately. Why? Because God is holy. 
He cannot compromise and share himself with anything other than holiness. He's perfect, and that's the kind of God we want, believe it or not. If we had a God that was base and allowed corruption even into his own presence, that would not be a God worth worshiping or following. Oh, David, get on your sermon. All right, so here's the deal. The Ark of the Covenant is basically this beautiful gift from God. It's a gift from God. It was his idea. He presented it to them, and it was a tangible reminder that God was with his people, and they belonged to him. So there's this possession. He's, he's a jealous God. He loves the people that he calls his own. And so at this moment in history, the ark is very present. The ark is very celebrated. But at the same time, what's happening is there's this presence of systematic and habitual sin that is now entered in also into the hearts of the people. So the Ark of the Covenant is still present. God is still blessing and doing things, but there's also this compromise that comes in. And so at this moment in history, Eli, the high priest, is now up in his years, and he's literally going blind. Okay? And I think as I studied the scriptures, what the Lord I felt showed me is this kind of represented the, the eyes of Israel, the spiritual eyes of Israel. They're also losing their ability to see and know God and the truth of God. And as a result, their perspective of the ark has now become distorted and twisted. And over time, because their eyes have become blind, they no longer see the ark as a promise and a, a covenant and God's blessing. They now just see it kind of like a token kind of like a mascot, to be able to keep them winning, prospering, and advancing. And so that's kind of what they've now reduced the ark down to. And so the ark is really just a means to an end. They no longer pursue God for who he is. They only are pursuing God in this season for what he can give them and do for them. Aren't you glad that's not us anymore? Like anybody in here, I was thinking about this. I was, you're going to find that I, I also have a sarcastic bent to me. That was meant to be sarcastic. Um, you ever have someone in your life, like that person that, don't get me wrong, just hear me out on this, because I was thinking about this, like, they're always needing something from you. If they're in the room, don't look at them. Keep your eyes on me, okay? I don't want to turn this into a Dr. Phil episode, but... You know, you don't talk about, we all, we all have had that person in our lives where they're, you'll get that text and they're like, hey, bro, can I borrow your truck this weekend? You're like, yeah, sure. Hey, man, can you spot me 50 bucks till, till payday? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, next weekend, can you help my sister move? You're like, yes. And over time, whether they, they mean to or not, don't get me wrong, it's cool to help each other, but these types of people, after a while, you start thinking to myself, man, is this all that I'm good for? Like just helping you out and bailing you out when you get yourself in trouble? It's kind of it becomes this one-dimensional relationship, right? Where it's just this one-sided, and I think one of the grossest feelings in a relationship is the sense where you're feeling like you're being manipulated to do stuff for this person. Isn't that a gross feeling? Most of the time, there will be a separation that takes place where this person goes, enough. I'm not your genie. I'm not here just to be your servant. I'm here to love you and have this exchange. But if it's just this one-sided thing, this is not good. And this is kind of... What's happening here, I was thinking about when I was a kid, I would go to my dad and I'd go, as a teenager, more than likely, I'd, hey, uh, dad, I, you know I love you, man, right? Immediately the wallet comes out, okay, how much do you want? I think that's what the Israelites are doing with the ark. They're seeing it as God's wallet. And they're just saying, hey, God, can you open it up one more time and give us what we're looking for? I bring this up, not because the Israelites are being painted in a bad light, it's because we all have a tendency to do this, like in a big way, to only see God for what he can do for us instead of loving him for who he is. Like, take all of the Christian stuff that you believe and know in your mind and your heart. And objectively speaking, if I just went to you and I said, hey, listen, I have a contact and I'm able to sit, have you sit down for about 30 minutes with the person who made it like Saturn and kittens. Would you like to sit down and have coffee with the person who came up with that stuff? What? Spoiler alert, it's God, right? Here's the thing. What an intriguing figure just to know. But beyond all, he's just, like, he's unsearchable. You can never get to the, the bottom of who God is. And yet, 
We're just like, God, can you just help me pay my cell phone bill and keep my tires running? And, and uh, you know, Lord, help me to grow hair on my head because it's starting to go fall out. You can tell he didn't answer that prayer. But here's the thing. I heard Pastor Glenn last week talk about this subject, and this is what he said. He said, too many of us desire the benefits of the kingdom without ever wanting to submit to the king. We love the perks. We just don't want anyone telling us how to live our lives, man. And so this is what sin does, and this is where Israel is at. And so Galatians, though, has something to say about this perspective. It's an immature perspective on the pursuit of God. God is not a game or someone you can manipulate. Bottom line, Scripture says, make no mistake about it, church. God will never be mocked. For what you plant will always be the very thing that you harvest. And so the harvest you reap reveals the seed that you plant. Scripture goes on to, okay, well, what does that look like? Well, if you plant the corrupt seeds of selfishness, the self-life, how to just make my life better, you plant those kind of seeds, the self-centered life into this natural realm, Scripture says you can expect to experience a harvest of corruption. However, if you plant good seeds of the spirit life, you will reap the beautiful fruits that grow from the everlasting life of the capital S, spirit living within you. God is giving us these step by just to contrast this binary perspective on if you do it this way, this is what you get. If you choose to live this way, this is what you return on your harvest and your planting and your cultivation. The problem is, is that the seeds of corruption and selfishness have grown into a harvest of chaos in the kingdom of God. And the enemies of Israel, Philistines, they show up and we're going to surprise attack Israel. So they come in out of nowhere, and that particular moment, the protection that Israel grew to expect from having the Ark of the Covenant doesn't happen. 4,000 people die in this attack. Now, when we hear this number, we go, man, that's a, that's a chunk of people. Do you remember how many people died on 9-11? Over 3,000, right? Did that number not shake us to the, our core as a nation? 4,000 died unexpectedly in the same way. The enemy came in and attacked, and we began to ask a lot of questions when 9-11 took place, right? One of the questions is the same question the elders of the Israel are about to ask, and it's this. Verse 4, it says, and the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? That's not supposed to happen. And so they said, we got it. Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh, and if we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. Do you see the issue here? Their response is not repentance. Their response is a recipe. They're basically going, what is the recipe that we need to do again spiritually to regain our success and our military power and dominance? What is it? What's, what's the recipe? And this is where we go, man, the Israelites, what's wrong with them? God, don't they understand? No, 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 this is us. This is us. This is our tendency every day to do this, to reduce God to a recipe. When things go sideways in our lives, and I'll speak for myself, for too many of us, though, and me, our temptation is to choose a formula over faith. We love formulas. We want to be able to put God in the box, no pun intended, and to be able to know exactly how he's going to respond. And if we turn the right lever, if we sing loud enough, if we put enough coins in the buckets, whatever it may be, he owes us prominence, power, victory, overcome, right? Here is our pattern with this. When we have unchecked sin, and yes, the wind is blowing, not a, not a day to be outside. Aren't we glad we're in here, right? But when we have unchecked sin, let the Holy Spirit convict you here. When we get in a tight spot because we've allowed sin to steadily be entertained and allowed in our lives, compromise. I'm not talking about murdering people. I'm just talking about the slow drip. When we get into a tight spot, this is what many of us do. Man, I got to get back to church, right? I got to get back to church. I got to start listening to Caleb. Uh, I got to start wearing a cross around my neck. I got to stop cussing. What is the formula so that I can get back to enjoying the life that I had before I allowed it to be wrecked by sin? That's what we do. So we start spinning plates and we start trying to see how we can manipulate God and be able to get him back to where he begins to bless us again. But here is the thing. Have we ever thought how have I contributed to the situation? 
Like seriously, man, and, and hear me out. I'm not saying that every bad thing that happens to us is a result of our sin. But I will say when we have unchecked sin, that the Holy Spirit has been sweetly convicting us of saying, man, this is not my best for you. It's not about denying you something. It's about making sure that you're staying on the path of freedom. And then we're convicted, but we go, no, but I like the way the sin makes me feel. I like the way the sin makes me look. I like the way the sin sets my life up. And we don't want to give it up. That's called an idol. Okay? And so we allow this to come in. And so unchecked sin, we can't ignore that. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you this morning so we don't waste our time? Because this is the word for us. The reality is, is we can't ignore it. And when we do, it will always, I promise you, bring chaos into the ecosystem of every part of your life. Relationally, financially, spiritually, the way you see yourself, the way that you see God, it, everything gets messed up when we allow this to just, the steady drip of compromise and sin, compromise and sin. That's the case here. So for Israel... As I studied this passage, I'm, I'm learning it. it wasn't the absence of the ark that brought the loss of life and defeat. It was the unchecked presence of sin and compromise. So the Israelites, they bring the ark into the camp. They're thinking, this is our fix. This is our formula. Bring the ark in. Everybody's, yeah. They were cheering so loud that the ground thundered. There it is. That's the token that's going to bring us victory against these rotten Philistines. The Philistines here, they're like, man, these people are crazy. They're really into it. But what were they cheering for? It sounded like praise. It was loud. It was, it was, uh, just, un it was just unhindered praise. That's what it sounded like. But you see, we could sing till this roof flies off the top of this building. So loud. But God is looking at the motive of the heart. They were praising God for what they thought that ark was going to give them. They were not praising God. It was a mixed offering. Some were, but not all. It was a mixed offering they offered. So they go, we got the ark. Let's go kick some Philistine butt. Okay? Here, yeah, boy, the room just went. <gasps> so they... <laughs> So they entered into the battle with the Philistines. The Philistines fought desperately because they're freaking out. They're like, man, we got to give it 100% here because these guys are really serious about wiping us out. But the slaughter was great. But it wasn't the Philistines that got slaughtered. The Philistines, 30,000 of them with the ark, died that day. They had the ark, but 30,000 of them died. The survivors then turned and fled to their tents. They're freaking out. They cannot make sense of what's taking place. The ark, of the, God, or the ark of God was captured, and look who's there taking care of the ark. Hophni and Phinehas, they're there, and the two, sins of, or the two sons of Eli during this time are now killed. So they're there. They're still doing all the religious stuff, playing the religious roles, using their power to be able to satisfy their physical and sexual and political needs for themselves. They're gaming the system. They're corrupt. And it's representative of what the people of God have been living like. It's a symbol. It's a picture. It starts from here, but it goes down. This is why you have to be careful about the type of people you follow spiritually. And you allow people to speak into your lives. Because they may have the appearance of holiness and righteousness, but live Live like hell. And that's why you see this, this people who like speak the truth and it sounds right, but there's something in your spirit at the same time. You're like, what is it? It's such a high calling. And so these guys were doing all the right things from the outside, but their doom was sealed and they were killed that day. So the Lord is beginning to handle the issue of sin starting at the top. So now news of what has taken place goes back to Eli. He's told his sons have died and the ark has been captured. And so here we are. When the messenger mentioned what had happened to Eli, to the ark of God, Eli fell backward from his chair beside the gate. He broke his neck and he died for he was old and he was overweight. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years, 40 years of serving the Lord. But there was a point where he started to mail it in a little bit. He began to allow apathy and compromise to be entertained. And so his sons are now introducing evil into the temple of God. So just because you're not an active participant doesn't mean that you're still not responsible for what you oversee and lead. 
So we can turn a blind eye to it and act like stuff isn't there. But God has called us as God's people to address sin taking place. What is taking place in your homes that you're responsible for? To allow your kids to do certain things, even though you're not participating, you go, honey, no, 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 no. We have a responsibility in our homes, just as Eli did, to be able to lead with righteousness and grace and to point out sin and not tolerate it. But we just grow apathetic, complacent. And as long as God helps us pay our mortgage and we can get enough money in the account to put our kids in college, we're good. You see how this is working? So after the Philistines captured this ark of God, they took it from the battleground at Ebenezer to the town of Ashad. They carried the ark of God into the temple of Dagon. This is a satanic temple with a satanic idol, and they placed the ark of the covenant next to it. It's about to get weird, y'all. Here is the ark of God. Now, in Philistine hands, Israel has lost the ark, placed right next to this demonic statue. So there they are in the same room. And then it says, basically, the Philistines that night, because they liked the idea of having any god was a good god. So they thought adding the ark is just cool. And yeah, let's throw that in the mix, man. So they put the ark of God and Dagon, their big fancy god, they shut the door, they turn off the lights, and they go home. But when the citizens of Ashad went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark. Get this picture. Real story, y'all. So they took Dagon, and they had to prop homeboy back up. And I just begin to think about this. This, in my mind, once again, I was thinking that the, the, the idol was maybe a, this big. In my, I don't know why, but no. He was massive, 30, 40, 50 feet, beautifully carved, satanic. And just in the mere presence of God, no word speaks. Boom, face down before the ark of God. Who knows how many men with ropes it took to hoist him, that thing, back up? How embarrassing, man. This is your big fancy God that can't even stay up. You have to like bolt it to the floor. It's weird. I, I believe that before we look down our noses too much at the Philistines and poke fun at them, I want to point something out to you for a second. We all have this part in us like the Philistines where we naturally skew towards idolatry. Christians, God's people here, we love having God. He's number one in my life, but two, three, four, five, six, and nine are idols. This is, this is what we think. We think, God first. Yeah, I understand what you mean. No, God everything is really the way that we should be following him. God in our marriage, God in our children, God in our careers, God in our pursuits, God in the quiet moments when we're looking at our phones and no one else is paying attention to what we're looking at. God in every moment. Not God first, God everything. Otherwise, idolatry is going to creep in. Here's the thing, though. It's not just, oh, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, drugs, rock and roll. No, no, no. The idol could be your house. It could be your position at work. These are good things, blessings from God. Don't mishear me. Could be our kids and their academic and, and scholastic achievements. Maybe it's our paychecks. But how many, time, how many times when these potential gods begin to fail us, the house gets flooded, right? There's a medical emergency in our savings that we're so proud of. Get the, our, the promise of security, it gets wiped out. We don't have anything in the savings. Your kid brings home a D. God forbid. By the way, my daughter got honor roll last, <laughs> last week. I'm just saying, last report card. <sighs> but what do we do when things start falling apart that we put so much stock and worth in? Our tendency is to want to prop them back up. Reestablish them because we've made such a big deal about our identity and our value and it's tied to these things that when they fall and they show that they're really not that great of gods to put our faith and trust in to get our value, we got, I got to prop this thing back up. It's embarrassing. This is kind of what they're doing here. Maybe it's the opinions of how people think of you. Maybe that's the idol. Like, it could be your relatives. It could be people in this room. You care so much about how they see you and what they think of you that it's become an idol in your life. So you come to church so that you could hopefully be affirmed by Pastor Joe, which is 
I always love it when you affirm me, bro, but I can't worship you, man. You don't make for a good God. <laughs> and neither do I. And neither do you, by the way. But you're like, well, you know, Pastor Dave, although no one in here actually talks like that. Pastor Dave, you sure are throwing some rocks this morning. What's your idol? Well, maybe that was the Holy Spirit asking me that question. <laughs> because as I thought about it, I was like, you know, doing what I'm doing right this second, preaching. Like, it doesn't have to be terrible, evil things. You can't tell the difference. I can. And there have been seasons in my life where I'm doing exactly what I'm doing right now in the same way that I'm doing it, but it's giving me more meaning and purpose, and, and I'm drawing energy from it. I feel so alive when I'm doing it that I'm almost like God is a means to an end. God bless me so that I can do what I love doing. Thank you for this gift, but it can become an idol. So it can be anything, y'all. Satan doesn't care. He just wants you to worship something other than God. Even the things of God, like the Ark of the Covenant. How do you know if you're honestly an idolater this morning? Can, can we go there for a second? You need to know this. Because God will not stand. After today, you're kind of responsible how you deal with this. How radical you want to get about this. Because how do you know if you're really worshiping? Well, you can tell if you're worshiping other gods is to answer this question. What do you give your best to? Like what gets the best of your time, your talent, and your treasure? It could be good things. It could be sermon preparation. It could be anything. What are those things? I had a pastor I heard. He said, show me your calendar. And what you spend your money on, I will show you what you worship. Here's the thing. Look at it from another angle. Set that up to the side if that's too hardcore. Is a God worth trusting in? Like practically speaking, is a God worth trusting in where every time they fall and fail us on our own strength, we got to muster up the strength to pick and prop them back, back up? Listen, guys. I've done it both ways, man. Most of my life, I've worshipped other idols. Claim God worshipped other idols. Okay. I'm at a point in my life in my spiritual journey where I'm like, no, I need a God that will pick me up when I fail and fall. I don't need the responsibility of making sure that my gods do what they're supposed to do. They fail us, man. Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, expose the gods in this room right now. May they fall down and may they stay down. And so here's what happens next. The next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark again. So it's not a coincidence. But this time, the head and the hands were broken off, and they were lying in the doorway, and only the trunk of his body was left. Do you see what God has done? In the presence of God, he has dismembered this God. So not only can gods not stand in God's presence, they're going to fall apart on us, and it's okay. It's embarrassing, but it's all right. Look at this picture I found. <laughs> Put Dagon face down. Look at that. That's what you get. He was like half fish, half other stuff with no head. Praise God. But don't you think that God is trying to make a point? I'm no Sherlock when it comes to Scripture, but I think he's trying to explain something here because just a couple of feet away, inside of the ark, what's in there? The manna, Aaron's rod, and also the Ten Commandments. You see, in that ark, as Dagon is laying face down with his head off of his trunk, in that ark are the Ten Commandments. The first two commandments say this, I'm the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of slavery. You must not have any God before me. In Dagon's temple, the satanic temple, those words are in there. And the power of the law of God causes these idols to fall down on their face. They, in this moment, have more reverence than the people of God when it comes to this, these commands. Second one, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, Manitou, listen, I am the Lord your God, he's saying to us. I'm a jealous God who will, will not tolerate your affection for other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even the children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and just simply follow my commandments. Is there any question about where God stands on this? 
He's telling his people and he's saying to us, I'm not going to share my presence with any other God. And if I have to use a hyper sweaty bald man on Sunday morning to tell you this, I will. (laughs) Do we just keep gluing our gods back together? Is that what you want to leave out of here doing? Or maybe we need to forsake them because it could be that God knows better and we've been using him. So the Philistines, when given this choice, guess what they do? They can, they can actually respond to this as well. The presence of God is right there in their midst. They've kidnapped the presence of God. What represents God? And they go, no, nah, it's cool, man. We'd rather build a temple to a lie, worship a lie, be defined and stake our eternal destinies on a lie than accept the truth and be liberated by the presence and truth of God. So, yeah. so here's what happens. The Lord isn't really being slow. You have to understand. He's giving them a respo- an opportunity to respond. They could have done this differently. The Lord isn't slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. They had their chance. They rejected it. So the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashad and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors. When the people realized this was happening, they cried out, we can't keep the ark of God of Israel here any longer. He's against us. We're all going to die and be destroyed with the, along with Dagon, our, our precious glued back together God. Thousands are struck. Lots of people are dying. Philistines called in their priests. They said, what should we do about the ark of the Lord? Tell us how to return it to its own country. Send the ark of God back to Israel as a gift. They were told, send a guilt offering so the plague will stop. And then if you're healed, you're going to know that it was the hand of God that caused this plague. So what sort of guilt offering should we send? Well, since the plagues have struck both you and your five rulers, make five gold tumors and five gold rats, just like those that have ravaged your land. And make these things to show honor to the God of Israel. Perhaps he'll stop afflicting you, your gods, and your land. So the Philistines take two cows who have never pulled a cart before. They hitch it up. They have this cart. They put the Ark of uh, God on it. They also take this little box with the tumor, the gold tumors inside. And they're like, cows, see ya. They have this inner divine GPS. And they just make a straight beeline right back to Israel where the people of God are. Why would he want to allow them to go back? You ever thought about that? Wouldn't, like if you were God and you're fed up, wouldn't you just send it out into some distant place where it just disappears and no one can ever find it again? Because God loves his people and he loves you. And the overarching message of the entire Bible isn't that we sought after God and found him but that through any means necessary, he came for us, even if it means in this story, getting pulled on a cart to come back to his people. He can't leave his people and he's not gonna leave you and he's not gonna leave you alone. This is the truth. God is making his way back to you. Okay, so you've blown it. You've blown it. The gods of pornography destroying your family, destroying your sense of understanding of who God is, right? But you're in here this morning, you know why? Because he's not going to leave you alone. He loves you. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Scripture says, and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away those things. Before the foundations of the world, in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our desire to chase after idols instead of the living God, God loved us. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they do? They hid, didn't they? Who found them? God. He went pursuing them, found them naked and clothed them, restored them. God sets out Moses, right? He kills a guy in a fit of rage. He's got an anger issue. He, 40 years he's in a desert. Oh, God has forgotten about me. There's no way he could ever use me, do anything with me. But God shows up in a burning bush and says, not so fast. You can't get away from me that quickly. I still have work for you. Peter denied even knowing Jesus in the most important time of when the Lord was going through his crucifixion and torture. I don't know who he is. After the death, burial, or resurrection of Jesus, where do we find Jesus? He's standing on the shore. He's made breakfast for Peter, and he says, you're not done. He keeps showing up, and this morning, for some of you, this is your moment where God has shown up again to heal you, to heal your marriage, to heal your family, to heal the things that are broken in your life, but you have got to forsake the idols that have introduced a lot of this pain into your life. You have to forsake it. 
You feel that that's sweet, but that doesn't apply to you. It applies to the good Christians in here, but not you. You're not alone. This is how Israel felt. They're like, it says here, the ark remained in Kirith Jerem for a long time, 20 years in all. But during that time, all Israel mourned because, what does it say? It seemed like the Lord had abandoned them. Like the Israelites, they're dealing with regret. They're dealing with the shame of defeat, right? And so what they're doing is they're going, I don't see God. I can't feel God. He must have abandoned me. But I'm here to tell you, God didn't abandon Israel and he's not going to abandon you. It starts with understanding, though, that God is not far from you. So just as the air is around you, right in this moment, so is God's presence. The problem is, your eyes have become blind to, you're blind to this truth, but he is with you. So Israel has an opportunity. Not to just live a life going, man, those were the days when we were following God. He was blessing us, but now look what we've done. No, he's back, and this is what he asks them to do. Simply change your direction. The direction of your thinking, the direction of your affections, the direction of your pursuits. Put it back on me. Repent. That's what that word means. Simply do a U-turn. And so Samuel said to the people of Israel, if you want to return to the Lord God with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Asherah. So they're worshiping idols too. So both these groups of people are on seemingly polar opposite sides of the story, and yet they're just approaching the same result, just in different paths and different ways. Idolatry. And so we find out that the Philistines were worshiping other gods too. And so Samuel says, listen, turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone, and he will rescue you from the Philistines. So the Israelites, you know what they did? What God is asking you to do this morning. Get rid of the images that you've worshiped. Baal and Asherah and worship only God. And so Samuel, he's not a grown man at this point. He's grown up and he continued to judge Israel for the rest of his life. What do we do with this? Well, I want to share two passages of scripture and I'll let the Lord show you what you want, what you should do. I think there's two groups of people in here though. I believe the first group are those who thought that you needed to find the formula so that God would love you. And I'm here to tell you there's no formula. Jesus filled out and completed and walked out the formula for you. And so the reality is you can exchange your idols, your sin, your past, everything that you're ashamed of for the forgiveness of Jesus. It says in Scripture, it says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life can go away. The new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. That's how I'm a, this is me. I'm a new creation in Christ. I have no reason to stand up here and yell in a microphone outside of the fact that God did this for me. And now I have the task of reconciling you to him this morning. No longer counting people's sins against you. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation that makes me so happy to share with some of you today who didn't know this. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's for you. Lastly, though, we're about to take communion. As the band comes up and the Lord is beginning to pop in your mind the idols, that you're entertaining. Small idols, big idols, fancy idols, whatever those things are. And the Lord has convicted you. Don't say that you heard a good message this morning and didn't apply what the Lord told you. It doesn't matter how bad or good the, the message was delivered. What matters is your response as children of God. You see, Romans 2, 4 says, do the riches of God's extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he has been to you? Don't you understand that this morning is an act of mercy on his behalf so that you can get right with him? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Don't you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you also to repentance. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? One of the things about taking communion is before you take it, 
it's really a time to inspect your life. Because you don't want to take communion in an irreverent manner. Scripture talks about that. It's a, it's a sacred thing. So don't get freaked out. But you need to identify the things that you've been worshiping outside of God. Let him sweetly convict you. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come to the table, what I'm asking, Lord, is that today would be the day of salvation for those in here who are ready to exchange their life for the life of Jesus, for the forgiveness and the love of Christ. But for your church, Father, Lord, in your grace, have your way. And so, Father, we confess our idols. We forsake them. In Jesus' name.